Welcome back. Thanks to Marina Kolbe in Atlanta. I'm James Lee in Hong Kong, now living in Asia. His name is familiar not only in Asia, but around the world. Bruce Lee, martial arts legend, action film superstar, and cultural icon. 25 years ago, he died at the age of 32. Today, his philosophy and martial arts are still an inspiration to fans and followers. For more on the Bruce Lee phenomenon, I spoke to Bay Logan, the author of the book, Hong Kong Action Cinema. I first asked him how some people are marking the 25th anniversary of Bruce Lee's death. Well, worldwide it's amazing, considering you're talking about a, a little Chinese actor who appeared in only four and a half completed films. You've got events happening in America. There's going to be a gathering at the graveside in Seattle where Bruce is buried, of his family and students and friends. They're commemorating there. In L.A., there's a, a commemoration kind of based around the re-release of Enter the Dragon that's just happened. So that's kind of a 25th anniversary event. And here in Hong Kong, we have a number of events. On Monday, there's a great big... Uh, fan gathering from Japanese fans coming to Hong Kong. We have 150 Japanese fans and representatives from Europe and America, from Germany, from Sweden, all coming here to pay their respects to Bruce in what's really um, his hometown. So across the world, people are kind of remembering who Bruce Lee was and I, I guess what he meant to them. Well, you're talking about all these fans. Bruce Lee is still so popular. I was recently in the States and he's still on the cover of most of these mm. martial arts magazines. They talk about his style, his influence, mm. his philosophy. What is behind all this popularity? I think part of the appeal of Bruce Lee is the fact that he's a very self-sufficient individual as a, film, as a screen hero. He's not like James Bond or The Terminator where he needs guns and special cars and devices and briefcases and this kind of thing. Basically, he solves all the problems in his life with his courage, his hands and feet, his physical dexterity, maybe a few wooden weapons. And I think that the modern age is, is a time when people feel out of control of their own lives. And you see Bruce Lee in a movie, and you see somebody who's completely in control of his environment, and by his own effort, not with superpowers, not with any special government agency to back him up, but just because of who he is. And I think as time passes and people feel less in control, they feel that they don't understand new technology, that they're in danger from various outside elements, that Bruce Lee becomes more and more of a potent icon. And I think as time passes into the millennium, he'll become even more powerful for that reason. Okay, we have some clips from Way of the Dragon. Let's take a look. Let's analyze Way of the Dragon. What makes it a Bruce Lee film and what makes it different from other martial arts movies? Well, Way of the Dragon was Bruce Lee's directorial debut. And he was somebody, I think, constantly, when faced with a challenge, he wanted to break new ground. So, I mean, his first couple of movies had been very standardized Hong Kong chop socky films with the standard formula plot, in, with Bruce Lee's action inserted into them. And with this, he wanted to do all kinds of new stuff. So, whereas every other film was shot in Hong Kong, he went to Rome, where no Chinese film had ever been shot before. And whereas most Chinese movies most of the villains were, West, were Chinese, he said, no, I'm going to have a Westerner. And not just some guy we pick up off the street in Hong Kong, I'm going to get the American karate champion who was Chuck Norris. He went on to great fame in Walker, Texas Ranger. And this was his first uh, real role. And Bruce, I think, had an innate sense of spectacle. And you look at the end fight, it's not just in some back alley, like in most films of that era, Chinese films of that era, it's in the Coliseum. So you've got these two guys, a little Chinese guy, this great burly Westerner, and it's like two gladiators duking it out. So I think in this film you see the development of Bruce Lee in terms of new ideas, bringing new ideas into the action genre, this sense of spectacle, and also a, a kind of keen sense of humor. And if you look at the film structurally, it's very similar to Rumble in the Bronx, which was Jackie Chan's breakthrough film, which is kind of interesting, you know, like a lone Chinese guy traveling to a strange country as a stranger and dealing with all these problems using these remarkable physical skills. You mentioned Jackie Chan, a lot of uh, Asian actors, Hong Kong actors, have tried to follow in Bruce Lee's footsteps. Um, to me, there really is no comparison. Can anyone fill his shoes? I think that a lot of people, not just in Hong Kong films, can be inspired by and can be the next level on from what Bruce Lee was doing. But you can't copy him. If you copy him just the same as him, then you don't really need that because we already had Bruce Lee. Would Bruce Lee be as popular today if he didn't die? I think that he would have evolved into a different kind of performer and a different kind of filmmaker. I mean, you can see uh, from one of his unmade scripts, The Silent Flute, and from the film he didn't finish, Game of Death, that he had a great desire to make a more philosophical film. 
and I think he would have become a world-class filmmaker and have moved on beyond the point he was at when he died, which is that he was the most widely recognized action performer, martial arts action performer, kung fu movie idol. I think he would have become a world-class filmmaker, and I think um, he would have been remembered more in the league of someone like Kurosawa, the Japanese director, than in his, you know, his uh, contemporaries in Hong Kong cinema who are known basically for doing kung fu pictures. That was Bay Logan. And now a look at this morning's news from Beyond Asia. The first high-level talks between Israeli and Palestinian negotiators in months are over without any agreement. Israeli Defense Minister Yitzhak Mordecai and Palestinian negotiator Mahmoud Abbas met for more than three hours yesterday to discuss a U.S. proposal for withdrawals from the West Bank. But both sides are planning, planning to meet again this week. News reports from Nigeria say the country's military ruler will unveil his plan for a transition to democracy. Nigeria's Guardian newspaper reports General Abdul Salam Abu Bakar will outline the plan himself in a national broadcast. Opposition leaders who have met with the general say they expect him to appoint a new cabinet and possibly a civilian to run the government until elections are held. More heavy fighting has been reported between Yugoslav forces and ethnic Albanian guerrillas in Kosovo. Fighting around Arahavac has entered its third day. <laughs> The town, about 50 kilometers southwest of Pristina, normally has a population of about 20,000, but many residents have fled the fighting. Both sides claim to have taken control of most of the town, but reporters on the scene say it's not clear which side is in control. Well, the British Open has served up a full plate of style, if not surprises. CNN's Tom West has added more in your World Sport Update. All the talk in golf the last year has been about the young superstars taking over the sport. But after the British Open Sunday, a 41-year-old man now owns two of this year's majors. The game's greatest new star, Tiger Woods, birdied three of the last four holes to finish one over par, but miss a playoff by one. The 17-year-old English wonder kid, Justin Rose, had a fabulous end to his weekend, tying for fourth at plus two with this chip-in birdie on the 18th hole. Third round later, Brian Watts was in trouble on the 18th, needing a par to force a playoff with Mark O'Mara. With a great bunker shot, he forced a four-hole showdown with the Masters champion. Then on the last of the extra holes, O'Mara only needed to two-putt from here. He rolls it in to beat Watts by two strokes. O'Mara is the first man since Nick Price won the 1994 British Open and US PGA to win two majors in the same year and makes it the fourth year in a row that an American carries home the fabled Claret Jug. In Davis Cup Tennis Sunday, Germany's Nicholas Kiefer in the near court needed to win to keep his country from being eliminated by Sweden. But Jonas Bjorkman, ranked ninth in the world, would prevail in five grueling sets. It'd give the defending champions and six-time Davis Cup holders an insurmountable lead in this quarterfinal tie. Sweden will now host Spain in the semifinals after they eliminated Switzerland on Sunday. The United States and Italy had already clinched spots in the next round. The Americans will be home for the semifinals. Germany was host to the Grand Prix Motorcycle Circuit Sunday. This is New Zealand's Simon Crafar, the 500cc winner two weeks ago in England, crashing out. Australia's Michael Doohan, the circuit leader, steadily pulled away from the field and earned the 50th victory of his career. The locals had lots to celebrate at the Tour de France Sunday. Frenchman Jackie Durand won the eighth stage, and countryman Laurent Debienne wrenched the overall lead away from reigning champion Jan Ulrich. That's our brief world sport update for this hour. I'm Tom West.